So hi there. Little disclaimer. I sometimes say things that may seem funny, but are actually deadly serious. Because one of the things that our medium is good at, and that we are good at, is by laughing a lot while thinking heavy and deep thoughts. So, some of the stuff here may seem like utter and complete bullshit, but I believe most of it. Some of it just is utter and complete bullshit, put it there to be funny. But if you can't figure out what's what, just treat it all as serious as <coughs> insightful. That will make your experience better, and it will make my experience better as a speaker. And when it comes down to it, when we do LARPs, we do designed experiences. We try to stage memorable experiences. We can't guarantee that they're going to go like we want. Maybe we put all the orcs in the forest, and they just want to go home because it's raining. That's not exactly the experience we're aiming for, but we can try our best to make it happen. So, with those words said, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about when LARP went mainstream. And of course, that's a bullshit title, because LARP is not mainstream. <laughs> but how many of you had seen this castle and can remember from before this conference? How many of you have any idea where that place is or what it is? Excellent. This is Choha Castle in Poland, home of the Harry Potter inspired, not Harry Potter at all, <laughs> College of Wizardry. But the first one was a Harry Potter lot that we did in 2014. And that was a bit crazy because I got this mail after the lot. And that was uh, the first time I've gotten one of those. There was, after the lot, we had a video that went viral, a documentation video, and we had pictures from our photographers that went viral, as in not viral as, oh, it got 56 shares on Facebook, that's fucking awesome. Which is normally more than enough to get me excited with my projects. 56 <laughs> shares on Facebook, because that's cool, especially for <coughs> people. This was not the case. This got something like uh, millions and millions of social media impressions. It came up in the most crazy places. For a couple of weeks, uh, my life was weird. I would pick up the phone, and it would be like, oh, I'm a journalist from Vanity Fair. I'm not even sure what Vanity Fair was. <laughs> and some of this stuff I would like, because one of the things I enjoy very much in my private life is like casually and offhandedly mentioning things to my wife. Things like, oh, next week I'll be going to a conference in Texas to be a keynote speaker. To her. Why did you not tell me about this? At least I have a week of vacation. But, and for this period of time, it was especially brilliant because it meant I could say things like, or do you know what Seventeen Magazine is? Because I, I don't really know what like Seventeen Magazine is. It's like one of the biggest teen magazines in the world. Why? Yeah, I mean, they asked for an interview. <laughs> and it was all over the place. It was on MTV, it was in Time Magazine, the actual printed magazine, not the dot-com version. Why that difference is significant will be uh, apparent later. And the MTV article on MTV.com, which kind of kicked the whole thing off for real, had 37,000 37, shares on Facebook. Which is a little bit more than the 56 I normally go for. It was even on Fox News. <laughs> and the reason I mention that is because, in my prejudiced and horrible view of the world, everybody from Texas looks like that. <laughs> and, and they only watch Fox News. I know, of course, this is not true. But the point is that some of the people who do watch Fox News are not our normal target demographic. I think we can say that and laugh about it if there's somebody who just says, that's where, I, watch. that's where I saw it. <laughs> I could not have designed for that experience. <laughs> but I could do my best to help save it. Now, we suddenly had fans in Peru. We had uh, several thousand strong fan club in Taiwan. I don't know if they actually understood what we were doing. We realized that many of the people who read about what we were doing did not understand. We got a call from an Indian trade magazine, uh, and I am not sure what they think it was, but it was definitely not large. They mainly wanted me to sign a contract so they could get up to their 100 million readership. And I tried to explain to the phone, I was like, yes, yes. And then I realized, after I hung up, I realized a piece of info I've gotten from my sister who's done some work with people from India is that in the culture, especially if you're approaching somebody of like a higher status somehow, then you don't say no. So when somebody asks you understand, which I did several times, you just say yes, even if you have no fucking clue. So I will never know what came out of that if the guy thought, yeah, yeah, I totally understand it, or like, go write about it, Harry Potter. Oh. 
Now, we had Thomas Wiley, who was going to round off the whole, all the people who contacted Thomas Wiley, I think he looks like that in spirit form. And the reason I mentioned spirit form is that he wrote to us and said, Hi, I'm Thomas Wiley, I'm a professional, uh, or I'm a, I'm a magician and a shaman, and uh, obviously you're doing a great thing, I would like to come teach. And then I wrote, Hi, Thomas Wiley, thank you for your interest. I think it should be mentioned that what we're doing is actually not magic, we're just pretending. And then he wrote, Oh, that's very interesting, cool. Uh, I guess that in reality, or well, he wrote, I'm of course sure that everyone who goes to an event like, like that secretly wants to do actual magic. <laughs> and then I wrote, maybe, maybe not, we'll never know, but again, thanks for your interest and, and good luck with all your projects. And he wrote, if we ever needed to, uh, him to come teach, it would be good, but it might take longer time because, and this is where the catch, and this is why I think it's a little bit okay to make fun of him, because he wrote, learning how to do real magic takes more than a weekend, of course, it actually takes from 3 to 20 years. And I thought that was very specific. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, we got contacted by a lot of people. Let's just leave it at that. This is a picture of me uh, killed by a falling chandelier at a mafia bar. I was surprised then, even though it was a staged event. Were we surprised that, yes, there's only one answer, and that is fuck. Yes. <laughs> Nobody saw this coming. Nobody could have seen this coming. Suddenly, a small 140-person event had gotten global press attention. It was in a printed newspaper in Ecuador. We could not have seen this coming at all. And I kept telling myself this, and I still tell myself this. But luckily, I have a partner in crime currently sitting down in the audience. His name is Alan Brown, who I work with every day. And Anna says, Klaus, you are a idiot. <laughs> of course it makes perfect sense. We do these designed experiences. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't, but we do our best to try. Of course it makes sense that this happened. Of course it makes sense that this has gotten to the place where it has. It's not just a random coincidence. It's not like we just woke up one day and suddenly we've done a LARP that was globally, uh, reached globally was the word I was reaching for. It makes sense. And then he said, what did you get, how did it even, how did people even hear about it? Well, they heard about it because of the Cosmic Joke film crew, who came with us from Manchester in England, and who did this short one minute 40 uh, film that went completely viral and was shown everywhere. It's like, okay, that's, that's actually true. If we hadn't gotten them, uh, it would never have happened. And we, we got them on board because we'd worked with them on Panoptico, a project uh, I'd done with the help of Eide Fatla, who was also sitting in the audience doing a remake of an old Nordic Park uh, one year earlier. We'd invited them to that, so of course we invited them to this. It made perfect sense to have a cosmic joke there. And of course it meant that now we had a professional documentation crew that managed to shoot a very cool video. It made sense, and I said, yeah, okay, I had to acknowledge that. Usually, Anas will call me an idiot, and I will listen, because he's almost never right, and I love pointing that out. But sometimes he is, and this was one of the times. Of course, we had cosmic joke there. We also had Christina Mulder, who does pictures for us, and whose pictures are now all over the globe in, in uh, College of Wizardry sense. And we've been working with her since 2008 when she started doing pictures for us. We even published a book together with her, a picture book on Warps we did. So of course it made sense to invite her along. She started as the mother of one of our kids in the, not like we had kids together, not that sort of kid, but uh, kids at our LARPs in the forest with kids. And she was a mother who came along and liked photography, so she started taking pictures. And we did more and more things where she came along. And here, of course, it was natural to invite her to this. We also had the pictures of John Paul Bicard, who I met a few years later at uh, another event designed by, amongst other people, Jaco Peterson, ironically enough, also in the audience. Martin Erickson, who is also, if not in the audience, then at least hung over in some room somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, he actually isn't. He might just be sleeping. <laughs> But I met John Paul at this event a little earlier, we clicked <coughs> so when Kurt came to shove on this, it was natural to write to him and say, hey John Paul, do you want to go? I know you're a hotshot professional photographer and you normally cost more than the project itself, but uh, we're friends, right? <laughs> <laughs> Creative labor and all that. He loved the chance to go along and he had a good time and his pictures also. So, of course, we had this, so it could spread. And of course, we had done the event itself. And that may not have been completely apparent. Why did we do College of Wizardry? Well, that's quite simple. We'd come up with the idea for it while drunk. 
and then uh, decided, let's do this, then booked the castle, launched the webpage six days later after the original drunken conversation at 4 a.m. at night, uh, and then in two days it sold out. We, of course, did a lot of marketing for it. We made one post on my personal Facebook page. <laughs> and that got, I think that actually got 56 shares. <laughs> so we'd, of course, done that. I mean, we had to do the project before it spread. And the reason we could do it was I met Draken, this Polish guy, Draken Minsky, our creative lead. I met him at the Cleveland 2014 conference. He'd come over and poke me and be like, hi, you're Klaus, I've, I've heard about some of your work, I want to talk. And then because I was drunk, I said, sure. And then we made fun of some other people, and then we got to talk and he said, uh, let me show you a Polish castle. I said, that's, that's very nice, what does it cost? And then he said, price, and I said, you're, you're lying, but if you're not, let's talk tomorrow. And then we talked tomorrow, he wasn't lying, we put together the basic idea for the project, we launched it, it was all good. And I met Drachen there because I was at Kluipunk, 2014, where I've been, uh, this year was my 17th Knudbunk, so of course I was at Knudbunk. I was also sometimes on stage in ridiculous outfits saying weird things. So Draken, who was also there, he'd come to Knudbunk to talk to some of these Nordic talkers who we found interesting. So of course we met there, that makes perfect sense. And one of the things he'd heard about was the penalty court thing. We'd got the Cosmic Joke people on board for that because we did this lot in 2013. I'd seen their treasure trap uh, uh, documentary thing, they were doing Kickstarter for that online. It was closed down, so I couldn't just support the project. So instead, I just sent them a mail saying, hi, guys, it may not be relevant for you, but I have this lark coming up. That's a Nordic thing. And if you don't already have that, it would be lovely to have you here. I'll pay for, pay for your plane tickets, uh, some food, some hosting. It won't be really luxurious, but maybe you can get some good filming. And if you do a small mini documentary for us, say like 10, 15 minutes, you'll get to do a segment for your thing. <coughs> and they came, and they were happy, because they had met somebody who trusted that they had good intent. When they did the film, they spent eight months persuading the British LARPers to even let them on site. And they always said, come, come, come. And they were a little bit surprised at this because, but I thought, we weren't afraid of the media. Why should we? We trusted the media. They tell our stories. So it made sense that Draken had gotten to see the mini documentary about Panopticoid and then said, hey, I want to actually talk to this guy since we're at the same conference. And of course, we had, uh, we trusted the media because we'd, early in the year, we'd worked with Discovery Channel on to showcasing another Nordic talk. This is me being very happy about somebody being tortured. That's very Nordic. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, I mean, of course the media is our friend. This Discovery Channel program has been sent in about 100 countries. Uh, it's part of uh, some other TV show, so it's only 15 minutes. Um, and in the end of it, one of the psychologists who's kind of an expert witness says, maybe world leaders should try this. So we're, we're quite happy. And of course they contacted us because there was a researcher who's, who read the interview with me in, uh, on time.com, not the magazine this time, uh, about why live action role play is one of Denmark's most popular pastimes. So this discovery researcher had fallen on that and said, oh, we got to contact these people. So that was natural. And the reason for that is that this is not Nathan Thornbow. Uh, it's his son, and I gave his son the first sword. So I'm a little bit proud of that. Of course he had contacted me to do the interview because he wanted to do a story about Denmark and found out that in Denmark we have Smart, well, we have Christiania, and we have LARP. I don't know where he found that out. But so he wrote, so he wrote to people he could find that had to do with LARP, and several of them didn't have time or didn't want to do it. They just pointed and said, you should talk with Klaus. He, he's good with his kind of media thing, and he has time, and we'll do it for free. Um, so that was natural. And we had earlier in the year, Anas and I had done the eighth installment in the Warlock series where we got national press. This is the front pages of the culture section of Putin, one of the biggest national Danish newspapers. So of course these people could point to me and say, yeah, he has some media experience. Talk to him. It's, it, it makes sense to connect us. Yeah, sure. And I'd done some media work before. The Spiral, where I met John Paul Picard, had shown me it's a multimedia project that uses LARP as part of like transmedia, the whole shebang, TV series of five, eight different countries. Big, big thing. I was a very, very small cognitive, but I got to meet some people and say, hey, be impressed at this. So, of course, I mean, I had done media stuff before, and I wanted to, we wanted to do heavy uh, media presence for the uh, Warlock part because we could see what this could be, and we want to do that. Anas had at the same time done the Capo project, which I helped do a documentation book for, where they also aimed at getting press. So, we were kind of in a press zone and designed, when we designed the lot, we designed for getting that. So, that makes sense. 
And we'd also done stuff for the Roskilde Cathedral for some years, a, a big thing where we do with like two or 3,000 confirmation students. The bishop says nice thing about us. So we were already like a little bit press savvy. And uh, sometimes we failed. This is uh, not a picture from the actual Vaterland press conference, but just of a happy player not realizing what, that when you drive around in the streets of the, the Danish countryside, you should maybe not be wearing the uniform you use at the game or be highly so happily about it. <laughs> but we did hold a press conference where we even had international participants and there was a nice article. So like active press work was already a part of our thing and had been so since we started doing children's lives together where we got, by random coincidence, we got some good press, but the, the press led to more players and more acceptance and we saw this is powerful. And luckily I had some media training because I actually do have a past as a reality TV star, uh, silly as it may seem. This is me with one of the hottest, shottest uh, Danish football players at the time worth like 15 million dollars or so. So somebody who has like actual skill in something. So I was pretty good with the media and was not afraid because I had massive training. And I was of course on the soccer team because the national organization for Lockwood Pokemon said, somebody putting together this TV show, we want you to go do it because they want a larger. And I helped fund the, found the national organization the year earlier, so it was natural for them to ask me. After all, at the time I was a hotshot LARP organizer, with apparently no real understanding of pictures will stay on the internet forever. <laughs> <laughs> so it made perfect sense that I was one of the driving forces behind starting the national organization. And of course I was a hotshot designer because I organized LARP since I was 16, so I was just on, on a natural progression path. And I started playing them at 13, so starting as an organizer at 16, of course, made perfect sense. You play a little, then you start taking more responsibility. And I started LARPing because I joined a role-playing club half a year before to meet some other people. I've been role-playing and GMing since I was eight. This is not me, these are my siblings, they're very cute. Um, but I've been GMing since I was eight. And the reason for that was because when I started in 87, <laughs> nobody else did it, so somebody had to learn. Um, and I, of course, heard about role-playing games from my friend Christopher, who was six years old and I was eight at the time. So, of course, I started role-playing. Um, that was 1987. <laughs> so, of course, it makes sense that cow is, uh, was a viral hit and we now got uh, mainstream media text. But it's a very simple and linear progression. <laughs> <laughs> now, the key thing is, this was not a design experience. I did not, at the age of eight, say, this is what I'm going to do. And Christopher definitely did not say, I'm going to talk to this weird guy who's eight at my uh, <coughs> preschool thingy thingy, and then many years from now, the hobby that we both will come to enjoy will become world famous because of that. And of course, there were many other factors. I did not do that shit alone. I'm just taking credit for it, because that's kind of what I do. <laughs> not always, I trust. This isn't about me. This is actually about you guys and about the future. Because what can you do to help this? What can you do? You're, of course, not supposed to be me. That would be horrible. There is only room for so many potential castes in the world. But you can do some things about this. And this is some of the stuff I've been doing that has led me to this. This is always be willing to have the conversation, just as Emily Care Boss was here. When somebody came, stuck a camera up in her face and said, Emily, do you want to be interviewed? She probably said, no, I really have interesting things to do, but fuck it, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> always be willing to have the conversation, no matter what it's about, but especially if it's about law. Do not be afraid to take chances. Launching a LARP you know, on an international scale at something that hadn't been done before with Six days of, I would call it preparation, but reality was it wasn't really six full days. I'm thinking this is going to be fine. It was not exactly a safe move. Luckily it worked this time. Trust the people even though it's scary and it sometimes goes wrong. Whether they're from the media or just people you have met at a conference. Trust them. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to make a lot of mistakes putting the sombrero without any explanation on this zombie guy from the future LARP was not one of my proudest moments. <laughs> or maybe it was, but it doesn't make sense at this. And I will now stand by that mm. instead of trying to sell you why it was a, there was no reason. <laughs> Be proud. Stop the shaming, especially of yourself. Show off what you do even when nobody understands what the fuck is going on on that page. <laughs> <laughs> and take the beatings even when it hurts. This is the hardest part. This is the one that sometimes stops me, but it hasn't yet. And sometimes it is horrible, whether they're from outsiders, whether they're from your friends. Take the beatings. You're going to get them. The only way of not getting beat is by not doing anything. It wax a little bit poetic. I want to share an oath with you. You can read aloud with me if you will, or you can just listen to me. This is from the poem, The Larker's Burden. This is what I will end with, and I want you to take it up with me. 
Take up the LARPer's burden. Send forth the best you will. Go bind your mind to exile and gladly pay the toll. To guide the muggles forward, to show the way ahead, your worlds to bring to others, all growing from your head. Take up the LARPer's burden, never again to hide, you to fight the threat of order, <laughs> to combat hate and pride, by free and frank creation, a hundred times the joy of passive junk consumption, imagination as your turn. <laughs> it doesn't fit with what's up there. <laughs> Sometimes you make mistakes. <laughs> Take up the LARPer's burden, the savage wars of thought. Call out the filth and badness, and give the foes you fought. You fight the different. Strike down the wills to fight, for fiction has no limits, no wrong and no more right. Take up the LARPer's burden, no tear to leave us shed, but cry and laugh together, and prove play is not dead. The craft you shall be sharing, the knowledge free for all. Your critics never ending. In culture, thanks to you all. Take up the larger burden and remember why you do. The faithful to inspire, the rest to slowly woo. So even as you stand there, bloody but unbowed, you try to give them passion and free them from the crowd. Take up the larger burden and forget all petty fear, for we shall change the planet, conquer it year by year. Now choose the path of wisdom, of fantasy and dream. And go create some futures that are not what they seem. Take up the LARPer's burden, devour the bluest spill. They say people can be broken, we say it slowly well. Show off your love and kindness, keep apathy at bay. Remind the world that people are people when they play. We are the LARPers of the world. <laughs>